This is Einstein's greatest hits, or it's also called why you should study A-level physics. Einstein was not just a theoretical physicist, he was also, uh, he'd also designed a lot of experiments that uh, he used to give evidence for his theories. This is his incredible life, this is some of the best things that he did, some of the most incredible things that Einstein did in his life. It all began for Einstein when he was working in a patent office in Bern. He was working in a patent office, that's where people submit their kind of new inventions so they can't be copied. Um, this was his house, he was a Swiss Jew, Albert Einstein. In one year, his miracle year, his Annus Mirabilis, he did four of the most influential bits of physics ever. And um, here they are. This is in 1905. First of all, he explained something that nobody had any model for. It's the random motion of particles. If you observe um, smoke particles under a microscope, they appear to be like skittishly moving about completely random directions. And there was no kind of explanation for that until Einstein went ahead and did this bit of algebra here, which I'm not going to go into, but uh, which shows that they, these particles are moving about because they are being constantly bombarded from all different directions by other atoms in the air around it. So this is a mathematical proof of atoms. So this kind of theory of everything being made up of atoms is finally kind of proven by this piece of maths. That on its own, that was incredible. That paper on Brownian motion on its own would have been an incredible year. But he didn't stop there. He also carried on to do the photoelectric effect. And this is what he got his Nobel Prize for. So this equation, this photoelectric equation, explains that in the photoelectric effect, that light is not just a wave, it's also a particle. So you have the energy of a photon, that's HF, the frequency of the photon being proportional to the energy and H is Planck's constant. The phi, the Greek letter in the middle there is the work function, the energy needed to liberate an electron. And the kinetic energy is uh, the kinetic energy of the photoelectron that's emitted. Now, why is that incredible? Because actually that is the start of all of quantum physics. Quantum physics is the most successful model in physics. It's a model that explains almost everything, everything up to gravity, we've managed to explain based off this first little bit here, which was the realization of Einstein's that light was behaving as both a wave and a particle. He also in that year wrote special relativity, which is one of his most famous and least understood theories. But it's quite simple really in terms of its basics. All it really states is that the universe looks different depending on your frame of reference. Space and time, they change different depending on your frame of reference. So after this, after this theory, every single time they did any kind of science, they had to be figuring out which frame of reference are we gonna use for this. So here it is, is the simplest way, the analogy that he used. Imagine a clock, this is a special clock. This clock is actually consists of two mirrors. This clock, clock consists of a mirror at the bottom and a mirror at the top. And there's this photon in the middle that's transiting it. It's transiting, it's being reflected from the top mirror down to the bottom mirror. So this clock measures time by the time of which that photon takes to get between the two mirrors. Now that's fine, if you're sitting on the clock or the clock is stationary, then every single time that photon does a transit, it takes the same length of time. It's a perfect clock, right? But what if the clock isn't stationary? Well, there's two things. If you're sat on that clock moving along with the clock, then nothing changes because the photon moves backwards and forwards between the two mirrors with no issues whatsoever. But if you were to be looking at a moving clock, with, um, and you are stationary, then suddenly the situation's changed. Because now, every single time the photon moves to the top mirror, it's had to go a kind of diagonal path because that mirror is moving along. So each time the mirror moves, the photon is moving towards that mirror on a different path. But the speed of light is fixed. The speed of light stays the same. So it actually takes longer for that light to get between the bottom mirror and the top mirror. Then it reflects from the top mirror and then it moves towards the bottom mirror. But that bottom mirror is moving along as well. So again, it does a second diagonal path. Now, if you were sat on the clock, then relative to you, neither of those mirrors would be moving. So the clock still reads normal time. But compared to the person that's sitting stationary, it appears that time is going slower for you. So this has, has actual real ramifications. This has actual real physical evidence for it. We have to calibrate our clocks in our GPS satellites because of the speed that they are going. And we can send clocks very high speeds and we can measure the difference in time due to this relativistic effect. If you spend six months on the International Space Station whizzing around our planet, then time will have gone 0.007 seconds slower for you compared to the people here on Earth. It's the idea that actually you can do a little bit of time travel, but it's only one way and it's only uh, 
things appearing to be slower for you by going very fast away from Earth and then coming very fast back. And you will have experienced less time than people here on Earth. Interesting, right? <laughs> And there's something we always say about special relativity, which is that if you think you understand special relativity, you probably don't. So um, don't, you know, <laughs> don't worry too much about that being a bit complicated. But it is in some A-levels. It is in the OCR A-level. I know that it's not in all A-levels, but this idea of special relativity is in some A-levels. It's one of the fascinating things. And the last thing that he did was mass energy equivalence. Now, mass energy equivalence is E equals mc squared. And that is the most quoted and least understood expression. But it's famous for a reason. It's famous because Einstein telling us how we can get an awful lot of energy from a little bit of mass. So a little bit of mass multiplied by this really large number, c squared. c is the speed of light. So energy and mass are actually the same thing. They're equivalent to each other. So this is why nuclear reactions such as fission, fusion, or any type of nuclear decay really so much energy. It's because of this equation. Now Einstein actually, this is the mass that allowed us to make atom bombs. And Einstein did work on the Manhattan Project, and this is one of the things that he regretted for the rest of his life to be part of that. He actually said that uh, if I'd have known what this would have been used for, what e equals mc squared would have been used for, I would have just become a watchmaker, which was obviously a career path in Switzerland in those times. <laughs> Still is. <laughs> That's his Annus Mirabilis, okay, that is his miracle year, that is what he's really, really done that was incredible, you know, in one year to write those four amazing things, that's absolutely incredible. But I'm going to talk a little bit more about what Einstein did next, which is general relativity, and I'm going to talk about some of my favourite experiments of Einstein's. So first of all, we'll talk about the muon time of flight experiment. Now, the muon time of flight experiment was absolutely incredible. Einstein... <laughs> Einstein had to show his idea about time dilation. That's the idea of the clock and things going faster, time runs slower for them. So what he did was he found some stationary muons. Okay, so he looked at some stationary muons. Now muons are subatomic particles. They're like heavy leptons, heavy electrons, let's say. Um, they've got a negative charge and they're formed naturally, they're formed in our upper atmosphere by cosmic showers. So what he did was he made some muons in a stationary setting in a lab and he looked at their half-life now just like every other radioactive decay every other um, object there's a kind of probability at any point that it will decay to become something more stable so these muons stationary in the lab had a half-life you know the kind of half-life curve that you're used to from gcse uh, physics then he compared that half-life that decay rate to the muons that were moving incredibly fast from the upper atmosphere. And these muons in the upper atmosphere were moving downwards at close to the speed of light. That's the path, the last path, the lowest down path um, on this diagram here. It's got a mu symbol, which is like a U with a tail on the front. Now, he found that actually there were more muons at the bottom of the mountain than there should have been. So there should have been more of them decaying throughout that time which they were flying through the air. They should have decayed at a higher rate than they appeared to. And the only conclusion from that is that time for the muons has gone slower. So this is evidence for that idea of the clock that we were talking about at the start. Incredible. Um, I just think that's absolutely incredible. So we went back to the Swiss, Swiss Alps to actually facilitate that experiment. The next experiment isn't one that he actually conducted, but it's one that we conducted a long time in the future, which we conducted in the last decade, called LIGO, and it's about gravitational waves. Now, general relativity is a little bit um, distinct. It's a, it's a grander theory, it's a larger theory, it encompasses more things, and it's our best explanation of gravity that we have so far. Now, like this picture here, uh, imagine that what's actually happening with gravity is not that there's a physical kind of force, there's nothing kind of pulling, there's no exchange bosons, but what's actually happening is the mass Mass is warping space around it. So all masses, Einstein said, are actually warping space around them. So here in, in this photo, you can see that Earth is actually moving space around it. And the reason why the satellite goes around Earth in an orbit is because it is just trying to do uh, Newton 1, same speed, same direction, but the quickest possible route that it can do that, the, the kind of the straight line for it on that curved space is actually around um, the large center of mass. So that's the theory, that's general relativity. But as with all theories, we want to find some evidence for it. And this kind of theory was finally given evidence by an experiment called LIGO, which is the Laser Interferometry Gravitational Wave Observatory, LIGO. And they looked for something that would have a very set pattern of these kind of ripples. So if you imagine that warp in space-time is gonna create a wave, a gravitational wave. 
So to get evidence for Einstein's theory of general relativity, they looked out for an object in the universe that was doing something quite distinct. So they looked out for a pattern of two um, black holes which were orbiting each other. So they looked for two black holes which were orbiting each other. And if you can imagine two objects rotating around each other, maybe in a bath of water or, um, or a tray of water, then they would make a very distinct set of ripples. And they looked out for that on the LIGO, on the Laser Interferometry Gravitational Wave Observatory. So essentially what happens with LIGO is they send a laser up one of the arms and another laser up the other arm and those two arms are at right angles to each other. They compare those two lasers when they meet back at the observatory here. And um, if they are out of phase, then it means that actually the length of one of these arms is different to the length of the other arms. And it's those very, very, very slight changes in length that are caused by the gravitational waves, that are caused by that change to the shape of space-time because of the mo motion of these incredibly large masses in the universe. Incredible, right? So this is carrying on being used to provide more and more evidence to further our understanding of gravity. And that's really the next kind of step for science or physics right now is really trying to get a good understanding of gravity. It's the bit we couldn't explain with quantum. My last and probably my most famous experiment of Einstein's though, and this is the experiment that really made him an international superstar. So it, in the scientific community, things like special relativity, Brownian motion, the photoelectric effect made him massive, made him, you know, the most influential scientist. But it was the really, it was the international recognition and the kind of populism that this experiment actually made, uh, which was to explain that light itself can be affected by gravity. So we think of light as being pretty much massless um, and therefore we don't think of light as coming down to earth due to gravity and we can't really observe that the effect of gravity with something as small as our own um, earth. But we could observe the effect of gravity on light around maybe a star. So what you're actually seeing in this photo is not actually five stars, it's one massive star in the middle and another star which is directly behind it. And what's happening is that large mass is actually bending the light around it as it comes past. So the light is actually being changed direction. It's being refracted, if you like, by the gravity. So the gravity is actually acting like a lens. The gravity of the large and central star is acting like a lens. And therefore we're seeing these four stars or the same star four times either side of it. Amazing, right? So he explained what was going on in those patterns in the night sky that people thought were maybe strange groups of five stars. And to find this, he actually needed to wait for a solar eclipse. He needed to wait for a solar eclipse because he wanted to use our sun. And he wanted to say, well, th there's a star behind our sun and I can see it to the side of our sun because the light from it is being refracted around our sun. The issue is the sun is very, very bright. So he needed to wait for a solar eclipse so that actually he could see the stars to either side of the sun or see the stars that were in fact behind the sun and which could be visible to the side of the sun because of this gravitational lensing effect. Amazing, right? And the problem was that he wanted to do this experiment, he planned this experiment during the First World War. So he actually needed to wait for the First World War to finish <laughs> so that he could travel the world and actually get a solar eclipse and do these observations. It's an incredible, incredible, incredible um, experiment and we repeat it and we find the same thing. That the stars you can see to the side of this um, picture here are actually directly behind the sun. That is Einstein's greatest hits. That is not all he did. I would vastly recommend a bit of study into Einstein, especially if you are finished one of your courses or you're not sitting exams or anything like that, because Einstein, his life, and the science they did was absolutely incredible. And there's things like this that remind you how inspiring it is to study physics and how important all of these things are and how, how amazing people like Albert Einstein are. Well, thanks very much for watching. This has been Einstein's Greatest Hits, or why you should study A-level physics. <laughs>